Hello everyone, I'm Mr. K. Welcome back to Everything is Relative. Today we're going to be changing it up a bit and we're going to do some problem solving on the topic of alternating currents for Cambridge or CAIE A-level physics, subject code 9702. So we've done a crash course in the past on this topic which cover the most important concepts and the things that you need to know if you were studying for a test. But what's even more important is to actually apply those concepts in solving problems. So basically what I've done is chosen a selection of random questions from past year exam papers, past year paper 4 questions, and basically done the solutions to them. And in this video I'll run you through how we can get the solutions and how we can get the solutions that appear on the mark scheme. Remember the mark schemes themselves are simply for the markers. Okay, but it's important to know how to go about solving questions because the mark schemes usually don't give enough information. So the first question I found is from the October-November 2022 uh, exam series. This is paper 4.1 and this is question 7. So you'll notice that alternating currents in its current form haven't been, hasn't been around for too long in the, in the syllabus. Um, especially when it comes to things like rectification and smoothing. But if we dig deep enough, we can find some past year exam questions that are related to the topic that we're currently doing, which is now separated from magnetic fields. So here's a good question on alternating currents. The question says a sinusoidal alternating voltage has a root mean square or RMS potential difference of 4.2 volts and a frequency of 50 kilohertz. Now, the alternating voltage is applied across a resistor with a resistance 760 ohms. By considering the peak voltage, show that the maximum power dissipated in the resistor is 46 milliwatts. Okay, so I have to consider the peak vol voltage when solving this problem. The first thing I'm going to do, I'm given quite a bit of information. I'm given RMS potential differences, I'm given frequencies, I'm given a resistance, and I need to show a maximum power. To make things a little less difficult to put together, I'm going to write down on the left hand side all of the quantities that I'm given. So I'm going to start with the RMS voltage. I'm given this RMS voltage and I'm told that it's 4.2 volts. So I simply have a resistor in my circuit along with an AC power source. So nothing yeah, really difficult is happening here. The frequency, the rate at which the alternating current is switching, is 50 kilohertz. So another way of preventing myself from getting confused later on when I need to do a calculation is to open out the units early on. So a kilohertz is simply a thousand hertz. So that's 50,000 hertz. And the resistance we'll call it R, is 760 ohms. Now I may need, not need all of this to solve this problem, but it's still a good practice to write down what I have. When you visualize what you have, it becomes easier to understand what you need and what equation will relate what you have to what you need. Now what I do know, I want to find the maximum power, is that power, P, is equal to I squared times R, is equal to V times I, it's also equal to V squared over R. I'm going to choose this equation for a particular reason. Because again, if I look on the left hand side, V I am given, R I am given. So the equation that most suits what I want is this equation. P is equal to V naught squared, or V squared over R, and I'm going to put a subscript 0, meaning maximum power and maximum voltage, or peak voltage. Now I know that I don't have the peak voltage, I do have the RMS voltage. So I'm going to convert peak or RMS to peak. Remember, peak voltage is simply the square root of 2 times the RMS voltage. So I replace peak with root 2 times RMS. All of that needs to be squared and I divide that by the resistance R. Now if I put in my values, this is the square root of 2 all squared is 2, don't tell anyone, multiplied 
by the RMS voltage 4.2, and that needs to be squared. And we divide this by the resistance 760 ohms. I'm omitting the units here because all of my values are in SI, and so I should get my final answer in SI units, which is 46 times 10 to the minus 3 watts. Does this match what I was asked to find? Well, yes it does, but not exactly. Times 10 to the minus 3 can be replaced by this little m, milli. So this is simply, as the question asked us, 46 milliwatts. And so yes, I've shown that the maximum power that is dissipated in the resistor is 46 milliwatts. So it is the square of the potential difference, the peak potential difference across the ends of the resistor divided by the resistance of the resistor. That's the amount of energy per unit time passing through the resistor. And so this is an easy introduction to alternating currents and the power associated with it. Okay, so for the next part, next part of the question, we are told on figure 7.1, draw a smooth curve to show how the power P dissipated in the resistor varies with time T between t is equal to 0 and t is equal to 40 microseconds, assume that p is equal to 0 when t is equal to 0. Now this is difficult. I have a blank canvas literally, and I'm asked to draw the shape of the graph of power versus time. Now we know that power versus time also oscillates, but we have to figure out how it is going to oscillate. Now the first thing I know that whenever I draw an oscillating curve, um, a sinusoidal or cosinusoidal oscillation, you need to know the period of that oscillation, or else it becomes impossible to draw the shape. Okay, just like you need to know the gradient of a straight line graph to know its shape. So period is 1 over frequency. We know this from waves, from oscillations, from all different topics, and from AC circuits, or alternating currents itself. This is 1 divided by 50 thousand hertz, this is a period of 20 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds or 20 microseconds. I've chosen microseconds because I noticed that microseconds are the units of my horizontal axis, my time axis. Okay, so now that I know the period, I'm just going to do a slight sketch here on the left hand side of what a graph of current versus time through this resistor would look like. So my graph of current versus time, guess what, will also be an oscillating curve. This is an alternating current. I don't know what these values are, but one thing I know is that if power is zero when time is zero, current is zero when time is zero. So the graph starts at zero, goes to a maximum, comes back to zero, switches direction, and moves in the opposite direction. I'm going to draw one cycle. The time it takes for, this, for the completion of one cycle for the electrons essentially to oscillate about a fixed point back and then back to the starting point is 20 microseconds. And obviously half that time is 10 microseconds. So the current is zero every 10 microseconds. Guess what? That means that the power is zero every 10 microseconds. Power is I squared times R, current squared times the resistance. My current is oscillating positive and negative, but I squared is always positive. The resistance R is also always positive. We actually know this value, it's 760. So the power is oscillating, but the power is always positive. And so I have an oscillation that's always above the horizontal axis. This is why we have no negative values for power. It wouldn't really make sense. We have That would imply a negative energy. So I know the peak as well. Um, if I were to draw the peak, it would be at 46. So 46 is somewhere, not exactly, you don't have to be completely accurate, but it's somewhere there. And so the peak power is at 46. I start at 0. Just draw a little x. 
and the power is 0 every 10 microseconds. Ah, so I have an oscillating curve that touches the time axis every 10 microseconds but peaks at a value of 46 milliwatts. We calculated in the previous question that the peak power is 46 milliwatts. So what does this mean? This means if I were to sketch this graph, and I'm going to do so quite poorly, it's much easier on paper than it is digitally, but I have the graph peaking, which would happen at about 5, not about 5, at exactly 5 microseconds, going down to 0, at t is equal to 10 microseconds, and guess what? The pattern repeating itself. So technically, I should be sketching these points off on the graph. Again, this is just me doing it very untidily, but you with a pen and paper and ruler, hopefully, would be doing a much better job at this. And so notice the shape of this graph. Or notice what the shape should be. If I'm if I don't put it too badly, but you can see that this is still an oscillating curve. But the t-axis does not get crossed. The power is always positive. Energy is either dissipated in the resistor or not. It can't be negatively dissip dissipated in the resistor. And so this is what the shape of the graph roughly would look like. There should be four cycles, and the graph should be touching the time axis every 10 microseconds. The same as the current is. The current is 0. If I square that, 0 times 0 is 0. Multiplied by any resistance, it doesn't matter, it's still zero. And so every 10 microseconds, the power would be zero. So this is how I would draw this graph. Now, obviously, I've done some extra steps, which are not required, but help me solve the problem. Solving more problems like this will make this easier. You would probably need to just visualize it, and the sketch would come to you. If you need to do the extra work, by all means. It's a three-mark question, but it does require some time and means you do have the freedom of a little bit of time to do any side calculations. But it is important that you know what you're doing before you actually start plotting the graph. And this is why you always plot your graphs in pencil to ensure that any errors can be easily erased and then you can redo the solution if necessary. Okay, so the next question for one mark says, using your line in the previous question, A2, Explain why the mean power dissipated in the resistor is 23 milliwatts. Now, nowhere in this question are we given the number 23. But I need to explain why the mean power is 23. Now, the one thing I know about mean power, I'm going to call this simply P average, subscript AVG, is that we know that mean power is half peak power. We've seen this in the topic. So the mean power is half the peak power. The peak power is 46 milliwatts, which means the mean power is 23 milliwatts. And we can see this simply because if we look at the line, this line is symmetrical about that, that midway point. English is letting me down. This line is symmetrical about 46 over 2, which is 23 milliwatts. So if I find 23 on the graph, I'm going to estimate it to be somewhere here. This line, that is now my central point. It's no longer the x-axis as it is in the case of i versus t. It is at the center of this graph, and it's symmetrical about that central point. So the average power is at that central point. It's the middle. 23 milliwatts. So the average power is always half the peak power. And we can see that the symmetry, the line of symmetry here is the line P is equal to 23 milliwatts. So that's how we know that the mean power is 23 milliwatts. So that question is worth one mark. We're not done just yet though. So we need to explain, we need to do some explaining now. So I'm now told that the alternating voltage 
in part A is applied to a piezoelectric crystal in air. Explain what happens to the air surrounding the crystal. Okay, this is, I mean, this is covered more in the topic of medical physics in the new syllabus, but I guess we can talk about it anyway. But it will make more sense when you talk about piezoelectric crystals in medical physics. So, what happens first? Well, we have an alternating voltage, alternating current. Okay. So, the alternating voltage will make the crystal vibrate. What does this mean? If the crystal vibrates, it's going to make the surrounding air vibrate. Is that significant? Well, it is. When the crystal vibrates, the surrounding air vibrates, and then when air vibrates, remember, a vibration or disturbance in air is simply a sound wave. So a sound wave is produced, but the frequency is in the ultrasound range. So the frequency is too high for a human to observe, but this can be induced by simply passing an alternating voltage to a piezoelectric crystal. Having the crystal in air generates the sound waves in air. And so it's always good to write your answers as full sentences. The mark scheme may not have this, but again, you are writing a bit of a story. You need your story to make sense. It needs to be coherent. It needs to flow. So this in turn, after the alternating voltage makes the crystal vibrate, the vibrating crystal causes the surrounding air to vibrate. The vibration of air molecules is simply the creation of sound waves. So I'm simply going to say the sound waves that are produced are in the ultrasound frequency range. And so I've used all the lines available to me, no less and no more. It's not necessary that you need to. It's also not necessary that you write extra over and above and use five extra lines than you should. Remember, it's a very real possibility that if you write too much, you can end up contradicting yourself, which is, no, no, that's terrible, right? You don't want to contradict yourself, uh, especially for a Cambridge exam, especially for a question that's worth only a few marks. Okay, if you do contradict yourself, you can score, you could not score, you will not score a point for a point that is correct, but then contradicted on later on. Okay, so the alternating voltage makes the crystal vibrate, the surrounding air then vibrates and sound waves are produced in the ultrasound frequency range. Next part of the question says a second piezoelectric crystal is placed in the air near to the first crystal. Explain the effect of the surrounding air on the second crystal. Okay, well we know this, the surrounding air is vibrating. That was the effect that, the first, that happened because of the first crystal. But what effect does this have if we place a second crystal? Well it turns out that the effect is continuous. Right? The air surrounding the first crystal makes the second crystal vibrate. And just as everything started, this will generate an EMF in the second crystal. So I'm going to say this. I'm going to shorten my sen sentence just slightly, but I'm going to write it as full as possible so that it makes sense. So the air makes the second crystal vibrate. In doing so, an EMF is generated. So I'm going to say generating an EMF across it. And so a potential difference is generated across the crystal as the crystal is made to vibrate by this alternating voltage. Okay, so this, again, like I said, you will be seen in more detail when the topic of medical physics comes about. So this is a 10-mark question. We've answered all the sub-questions. I haven't omitted anything. 
Let's see where those 10 marks come from. Okay, for the first question, for the first sub-question A1, I am going to look at the mark scheme, but again, I mean, the mark scheme is only a guide, and I need to make sure that my answer is set out correctly. So, very importantly, using the correct equation will get you a mark, and also using the correct substitution into the equation, making sure that you convert V0 to VRMS. The final answer doesn't score you an accuracy mark because, well, it was given. It told you what the answer should be. Even if you didn't really plug the values into the calculator, you could have just written down what the final answer was if you were brave enough. So that would give you two marks. And I may be mistaken here or there, but this is roughly what I gleaned from the mark scheme. Um, but the second part of the question, uh, you get a mark for the correct peak. So the peak should be at 46 milliwatts. Again, I've drawn it very poorly, but you should get the peak roughly where it needs to be. The shape of the graph, the sinusoidal oscillating shape is important to score another mark. And for each of these troughs touching the time axis every 10 microseconds, a third mark is scored, and that scores you three marks. Yes, I've done extra work. The extra work helped me draw this graph, but it's not necessary that you show this. If you're doing it, do it aside in pencil so that it helps you later on, but it's not necessary, even though it is quite helpful. Next question says, use your line to explain why the mean power is 23 milliwatts. This is a single mark question. One mark questions shouldn't be taking you five minutes or more. If you feel like it's taking you too long, you should be leaving them and moving on. Simply for saying the line is symmetrical about 23 milliwatts gets you the mark. Or anything else about talking about how the average power is half the maximum power and hence half of 46 is 23 perfectly fine. And that scores you one mark. The next question B about the alternating voltage in the piezoelectric crystal. Now, these mark schemes are also just guides. These mark schemes can also change with time, depending on the discretion of the markers themselves. But the alternating voltage, its first effect is to make the crystal vibrate. That's important. That scores you a mark. The crystal vibrating causes the surrounding air to vibrate. This goes to the second mark. And the sound waves that are produced, or the waves that are produced, are in the ultrasound frequency range, scoring in the third mark. And that was three marks for that question. So explain, describe questions are just as important, if not more important in physics, than calculation questions. Many think that the calculation questions in physics are the most important, but that's not true. Calculating is great, the mathematics is great, but understanding the concept is much more important in physics. So for the last question, which is worth one mark, again, we shouldn't be writing too much. The air makes the second crystal vibrate when it's placed near the first. A vibrating crystal will have an EMF generated across it. That's the important point. And for stating that, you get one mark. And so your total would be 10. Seems a lot easier when you see it being done or you see someone doing it, right? Well, this would be you. This will be you once you practice. Do as many pasture exam questions as you can, but do them without seeing the solutions. Make sure that you are testing yourself, you're putting in the effort, making the learning process difficult enough so that you actually remember. So 10 marks is well, the norm for Cambridge Paper 4 question, right? So the next question I chose is from the Feb-March 2022 series. This is from Paper 4.2, and this is question 7. You notice the question numbers are always roughly the same. The questions are always set up in a way that follow the structure in which you cover the topics in class. So we cover alternating currents, in somewhere towards the middle, the latter part of the middle of the of A2 physics. And so this question will always be 
the latter part or the middle of part of the exam. So we are told that an alternating current AC is converted into a direct current DC using a full wave rectification circuit. Full wave rectification is novel, it's new to the syllabus, and so you can be pretty certain that they'd want to test it. So it possibly would be in the exam. Part of the diagram of the circuit is shown in figure 7.1. We are given an incomplete circuit, and we are first asked to complete the circuit. It also says on or in figure 7.1, so we need to complete it on the diagram. There's no need to redraw the diagram. If they ever say on figure whatever, you need to do your drawing on that figure in pencil. Remember, all drawing should be done in pencil. And we need to add the necessary components and the gaps. So the first thing I need to do is I need to close up these blank spaces because I don't want a circuit that's incomplete. It serves no purpose to anyone. So if you don't remember, I highly doubt that you would probably ask to, to draw this from scratch. Um, it's not out of the realm of possibility, but I doubt that that would be a question that would be fairly difficult and take a lot of time as well. So this is probably a more common type of question. Hey, fill in the blanks and show us what this would look like when it's completed. So how do I complete the circuit? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose my own direction to be positive. Remember what an AC input does. An AC input alternates every half cycle. One terminal is positive, the other is negative, and then the next half cycle the terminals flip. The one that is positive becomes negative and vice versa. Okay, so I have my diodes. Remember, this is full-wave rectification, not half-wave rectification. And I have a DC output. What does a full-wave rectifier do? It takes an AC input and gives you a DC output. Our main supply AC, but our devices use DC. So we have to use a rectifier in order to change or transform the AC into DC. Okay, so I'm going to follow the path of this current. It moves from the positive terminal. It then gets to the bridge. Oops, it can't go through the diode that's already gone. So it has to move to this way. Now, it's going to struggle to move across the blue line that I've drawn because this diode is preventing it. And it's not going to move to the negative terminal until it's passed through the DC output. And so it continues along this way. And as it continues, it moves through our output, our load, back into the bridge. Now, when it gets to the bridge, it can't move through the diode on the left because that will simply mean it's retracing its steps. If it did this, it would have infinite energy, just continue supplying energy to the, to the load. So what it will do is move through the path less traveled, the diode that has been untouched thus far, pass through the diode. It can because it's moving in the direction of the arrow, which is fine, and then move back to the negative terminal. Ah, so what does this mean? This means I can now draw my first diode. Current can only flow in the direction of the arrow, and so if I draw my diode, that's a terrible diode. If I draw my diode, the arrow of the diode is going to point up and to the right as we look at it. Current flows entirely through the circuit from positive to negative. In the next half cycle, the current flips direction. Plus becomes minus, minus becomes plus. So the current changes direction. So the current moves from positive terminal. Now it needs to get into the bridge. Can't go through the diode at the bottom. And so it has to pass through the blue line. It then can't flow through the diode that we've just drawn. And so it has to turn right and follow the same path as the current previously in the other half cycle did through the DC output. And so it will then re-enter the bridge. 
But now, again, it can't go to the right because that will mean retracing its steps. But what it can do is move to the left. And in doing so, we'll move back to the negative terminal, R. So this helps me complete the picture. I have a diode now that is pointing in that direction. So I've done a lot of extra work, but I've satisfied myself that the diodes that I've drawn to complete the full wave rectifier are indeed correct. And so even though this is one mark, we don't need to draw all of the funny symbols that I did. But the currents in opposite directions everywhere besides the DC output. Notice the arrows are opposite everywhere, but they are in the same direction when they get through the load, when they get through the DC output. That's what we want. DC simply means current moving in the same direction, direct current. So that's a clever way of putting the diodes together in order to get this DC output. All of this work, not that necessary, but I'm explaining the thought process that goes behind how you draw the direction of the diodes. So if someone, or if the examiner rather, were to flip this diagram on its head and rotate it slightly, you wouldn't be confused. You'd know exactly which direction the diodes should face. Okay, so the more you practice this, the easier it gets. Okay? This can't be changed in any way. We've been taught full wave rectification. This is what a full wave or bridge rectifier looks like, and so how much can it be changed? So understand the concept, and applying a solution to any kind of question is just application of that concept. Can't change much. Okay, so all of that talking literally just for one mark. It'll be worth it in the end. Second part of the question says, on figure 7.1, mark with a plus sign, a plus symbol, the positive output terminal of the rectifier. Okay, here's my output terminal, my rectifier. I need to draw the positive terminal, and I don't need to label the negative terminal, but I'll just do so anyway. Well, how do I know which direction is positive? Again, we're going to assume this is conventional current. Conventional current flows from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. In this case, I'm going from top to bottom. So if I'm moving from top to bottom and current flows from positive to negative, that's positive. That that's negative. My OCD doesn't allow me to just draw the positive sign, so I have to draw the minus terminal as well. But that's the positive terminal at the top and the minus terminal at the bottom. Okay. It doesn't change even though the terminals of the AC input are changing. That's essentially what full wave rectification is, turning AC into DC. And so this is a very long-winded two marks, but the process is important. So let's move on to the next question. So question B, question B simply says, the output voltage V of an AC power supply varies sinusoidally with time, as shown in figure 7.2, where we're given the voltage against time for an AC power supply. And they say, firstly, determine the equation for V in terms of T, where V is in volts and T is in seconds. So determine an equation for V. So looking at this, I have to find an equation that's going to represent this, basically a mathematical description of what I see in front of me. All I know is that from what I learned, the general form of anything that's oscillating x is equal to x naught sine omega t. Okay. But in this case, I have a voltage that's oscillating. So the voltage at any time t, which is v, is equal to the peak value v naught sine omega t. But I know none of these. Well, I can determine them, actually. My peak voltage is v naught. I can read my peak voltage off from the graph. If I read this off, I get this turns out to be almost exactly 3.5. You'll be allowed some leeway here and there, but that's 3.5 volts. So my peak voltage 
is 3.5 volts. I next need to find omega. I don't know what omega is. What I do know about the angular frequency omega is that it's related to the period of the oscillation. The period is how long it takes for a single complete cycle to occur. Omega, by definition, is 2 pi over t. That's 2 pi divided by the period. And if I look at the period, if I consider one complete cycle, I'm going to go from there, between there and there. This is one complete cycle. These two points are in phase. This constitutes an entire circle. It's a cycle. I have a, a complete crest and a complete trough, and I'm back to the starting position. The time that I read where my x is, believe it or not, is 2.5 seconds. So this is 2 pi divided by 2.5. So I can write this as 4 pi over 5. If I simplify this with my calculator, this is near enough 2.5. Ah, I now have a value for v0, I now have a value for omega. I can simplify this expression. Or I can write this expression down, rather. So v is equal to v0, which is 3.5 volts, times the sine of 4 pi by 5 t, or 3.5 sine 2.5 t. I now have my expression that gives me the voltage v at any time t. I plug in a value of t here, I get the value of v at that time, because v is oscillating. So this is essentially what we were doing. We wanted to express this graph mathematically for v as a function of t, which we've done successfully. So a little bit of mathematics, but if I know the general form, then everything else becomes straightforward. It's only a matter of finding what's missing in the general form of the equation, which in this case was peak voltage and angular frequency. Okay, the next part of the question says the supply is connected to a 12 ohm resistor. Calculate the mean power dissipated in the resistor. Ah, oh, well, mean power is average power. And as we've discussed before, average power is simply half the maximum power. Now, average power is the same as RMS power. If you remember from your content, average power is half peak power, and that's the RMS power. It turns out to be the same. So, RMS power is the square of the RMS voltage divided by the resistance. Aha! Things are becoming more clear. Do I have the voltage? I don't have the RMS voltage, but I do have the peak voltage since I calculated it before, 3.5 volts. But I can write RMS simply as peak. Okay. RMS is peak divided by root 2. So this becomes V0 squared divided by root 2 squared, V0 over root 2, and the root 2 squared is multiplied by R. Ah, I know V0, I know R, I can find the mean power, the average power, through the resistor. So this is 3.5 squared divided by, again, the root 2, the square root of 2 all squared is simply 2, times the resistance 12 ohms, the two significant figures. And so I get an answer, if I put this in my calculator, I get 5.104 times 10 to the minus 1 watts. All of the values in this problem are two significant figures. More especially, it's given the resistance is given to two significant figures. My answer here should be in two significant figures. And so I write this as 0 0.51 watts, which is two significant figures. If I'm putting 3, that's going to be a bit too much. If I'm putting 4, that's definitely too much. So writing an answer down in its most 
in the form that you see it in the calculator is, is important. When you put it on the dotted line, make sure you write it to the correct number of significant figures, two in this case. So this wasn't that long of a question. It was worth six marks, but we had to work quite a bit for those six marks. So let's go back and see how we would be graded. So the first part of the question was one mark. Now, you had to draw the two diodes correctly. If the diodes were flipped, or if the diodes didn't work in a sense that they didn't create this DC output, you wouldn't score the mark. And so that would be the way the diodes need to be drawn in order for the AC to be transformed to DC. So there is literally only one answer to this problem, one mark or nothing. The second part of the question asked us to draw a plus symbol on the positive terminal. Again, there can only be one positive terminal. It has to be the top one. And so that's the second mark for this question. Then we had to do a bit of analysis on this graph. We had to find the equation for V in terms of T. And this was worth two marks. So this one was a little bit more complicated. So the mark scheme allocates one mark for the calculation of omega, which is very important. Remember, omega had to be calculated, whereas V0 could simply be read off from the graph. And so calculating omega gets you one. Correct expression gets you the second. And so the calculation of omega is always important. You should always know how to calculate the angular frequency. It could come in the topic of oscillations, waves, or even appear here in alternating currents. The next question is also two marks, a last question, last sub-question in this, in this major question. Find the mean power. And simply, all of this work that I've done to say that the mean power is the RMS voltage squared over the resistance, turning that into a peak voltage and then ensuring the correct values go into that equation scores you a mark. And then for the accuracy of your final answer, considering significant figures and so on, you get a second. If you read the peak voltage incorrectly uh, as 3.6 or some other value, your answer here would change, but you would still get the accuracy mark provided you followed through correctly with the incorrect value. So that sub-question is worth two marks. Okay, so it's getting a bit better as we see it being done in front of us, as it sort of unfolds in front of us. The next question is from the 2020 exam, the Feb-March series. It's paper 4.2. It's now question 9. Notice how the question numbers change slightly, but they're still later on in the exam. We are told that the output, power, output of a power supply is given by 9 sine 20t. V is the potential difference in volts, T is the time in seconds. Determine for the output of the supply the root mean square or RMS voltage VRMS. It's the first sub-question. Now, I'm used to taking a peak voltage and finding an RMS. I've done this, but I'm not given a peak voltage. Wait a minute. Something I do know. The voltage of any alternating power supply can be written as a function of time as V0 sine omega t. Ah, the number before the sine is the peak voltage. So I can read off the peak voltage simply from this equation. The number before the t is omega. Remember, V0 and omega must be constant for a given power supply. If the power supply is changing, then this equation doesn't really work. So my RMS voltage is my peak voltage divided by root 2. Peak voltage is just read off. It's 9 volts divided by the square root of 2, which in the calculator gives me 6.364 volts. Now, obviously, I need an answer to two significant figures, since I'm given two significant figures for V0 and 2 for omega. Now, I can't write this as 6.3. I need to round this up because the number after 3 is 6. And so this becomes 6.4 volts. Now, I did extra working to make sure that 
And I wrote my working down. It's always a good and very advisable idea to always write down your thinking and your working. Step for step, we do the algebra first and arithmetic after. Or we do the rearranging of equations and then we plug in our values at the end to make sure that we are maintaining as much accuracy as possible. The next sub-question says find the period T. Now, the period T is going to be difficult. Period T doesn't come into this equation. But I do have an old friend that I can turn to. Omega is 2 pi divided by the period T. Remember this equation. Ah, with a little manipulation and some very difficult mathematics, I get T is 2 pi over omega. Hmm, I don't have omega, do I? Wait a minute, I do. Omega is the number before t. It's 20. Ah, so simply this is 2 pi divided by 20. Remember, omega is measured in radians per second, so this is 20 radians per second. Again in the calculator, my best friend, I get 3.142 times 10 to the minus 1 seconds. I still need two significant figures. And so my final answer should be 0 0.31. 3.1 times 10 to the minus 1, believe it or not, is 0 0.31. So two significant figures I get, figures, I get 0 0.31 seconds. That's the period of the signal. That's the amount of time it takes for the signal to complete one cycle. So the positive terminal to go to negative and come back to positive this happens in a time of 0 0.31 seconds. Question B looks a bit intimidating. We are given two graphs. We are told that the variations with time t of the output potential difference v from two different power supplies shown in figures on 9.1 and 9.2. They are drawn to the same scale. State and explain whether the same power would be dissipated in a one ohm resistor connected to each power supply. So, again, if you haven't covered electronics, as you wouldn't have if you are doing the new syllabus, this square wave might seem a bit, might seem a bit novel, might seem a bit scary. Right? The square wave is simply a digital signal. Okay? You don't have to identify what it is, but I need to know whether the power would be the same if we pass these two waves through a 1 ohm resistor. Now I know that RMS voltage and peak voltage for a sinusoidal oscillation are not the same, They're two different values. But if I do something to this graph on the right hand side, I'm going to simply draw a graph of V squared against T. The peak value would be obviously V naught squared. This is for the graph on the right hand side. Now if I draw a graph of v naught squared against t, I take this value v naught and I square it and I get another value v naught squared and that's going to be a straight line as well because all of these values are constant. And so I square each of them and I get a constant value and that's represented by a straight line. But then I have minus v naught and guess what? If I take minus v naught and I square it, I get the same thing, v naught squared. And so this part that's below the time axis gets flipped over and becomes positive as well. And guess what? This entire graph is simply a straight horizontal line. What does this mean? If it's simply a straight horizontal line, then V0 and VRMS are the same. There isn't a difference between the RMS value and the peak value, because if it's a constant, steady voltage, all that means is that RMS peak mean basically have no meaning. It's just one constant value. So how does this help us in the explanation? So for the graph on the left, I'm just going to put a lo little note so this makes sense. The average power dissipated in that one ohm resistor by the sinusoidal oscillating current is VRMS squared divided by R. And this is V naught squared 
divided by 2 because the RMS voltage is the peak voltage divided by the square root of 2. So what have I done here? RMS is V0 over root 2. So RMS squared is V0 squared divided by 2. Square root of 2 times 2 is 2. Resistance is 1, and so it simply disappears. Divide by 1 is just as if I'm writing. This would be V0 squared over 2 times 1, which is simply V0 squared over 2. For the square wave on the right-hand side, the average power dissipated through a resistor is the same equation, VRMS squared divided by R, but this is simply VRMS squared is the same as V0 squared. R is 1, and so I simply get the average power to be the same in value as V0 squared. And so we see that the power dissipated through the resistor would not be the same. Okay, but I need to mention this explicitly in words. Okay, because the question says state and explain. So what I will say is since the RMS voltages differ, the power does too. Now it's a one mark question. I don't need to do all this calculation and drawing of graphs. But again, it's about the idea. It's about getting it once and understanding it for life. So all you really needed to say here was since the RMS voltages differ, which you could see just by looking at the graphs without having to do all the drawing and calculations that I did, since the RMS voltages differ, the power does too. That's enough. Okay, so it turns out that square waves carry more energy, have a higher power than regular sine waves. And this is why the audio signals will sound different if they come from a sine wave as compared to a square wave. Okay, so that was a, a little bit of work, all for one mark, but rather we do the work and understand it than simply writing down an answer because the mark scheme says so. Okay, so that was the end of that question. Let's have a look at how we did. Okay, so the mark scheme for the first question offers only one mark for this. So you really had to get everything done correctly. You couldn't afford to slip up anywhere here. Convert the peak to an RMS, get the peak from that equation, everything for one mark. Okay, not a difficult one mark, but again, it's very easy with many steps to make errors. To find the period, in the next part of the question, this was worth two marks. Period is two pi over omega, for that relationship, you score 1. So knowing this relationship is vitally important. If you do, immediately you score a mark. For inserting it, inserting the correct values, putting it into the calculator, getting an accurate final answer, you score the second. That's worth 2 marks. And the next question, although we did quite a bit of work for it, is only worth 1 mark. And so my last sentence is the important one. This sentence is enough to score you a mark. I didn't need to do calculations or draw a diagram like I did, but if I saw this question worth two or three marks, a similar question worth two or three marks would probably need a bit more explanation. But one mark, simply stating that this RMS voltages are different, meaning the power is different, is enough. And that scores you the mark for that question. So that was February, March 2020. Now, Next up, we have a question from 2009, so going quite a way back in time. October, November 2009, paper 4.1, again, question 7. So this one is a little bit more involved. We are told that a sinusoidal alternating voltage is to be rectified. And we want to suggest one advantage of full-wave rectification as, a com as compared with half-wave rectification. Well... I mean, one advantage of full-wave rectification, if you remember what full-wave rectification is, actually, let's just draw a simple reminder. So an output voltage with time, when we use a single diode, we get half-wave rectification, where I turn AC into DC. 
if you remember, because DC is what I need. This is half wave. You can immediately see we have a large amount of time when nothing happens. Can't be ideal. Turns out it isn't ideal. This is why we don't use it. But full wave rectification takes those negative cycles that are cancelled in half wave and turns them into positive cycles. And this is full wave rectification. So we want to know an advantage of full wave over half wave. Well, we can clearly see at least one. It's only one mark, so I just need one advantage as asked for. I mean, one advantage of full wave rectification is there's less time with no current. So there's much less time without a current. The current is much more constant with full wave rectification than it is with half wave rectification. Another possible answer is that more output power is available. Simply because there's more current available. There's more power being supplied to the circuit because the, there's more current produced more consistently. So you can say more output power is available. This is another possible choice. You only need to state one choice and my suggestion would be to only state one. Stating more than one will well, wasn't asked by the question and could lead you to contradictions like I said earlier. And so another advantage is that there's less ripple. If you remember from the topic of alternating circuits, the ripple was the amount by which the current decreases as it goes from the peak of one to the other, the other hill, the next cycle. And the ripple is much smaller for full wave rectification than it is for half wave rectification, provided that the capacitor remains the same. So I'm going to say for the same capacitor or for a capacitor with the same smoothing ability. And so either one of these and any other sensible answer can be considered as one of the correct answers. I only need one advantage, so I shouldn't be mentioning too much. Now, the rectification that we talked about, full wave, is produced using this given circuit, so figure 7.1. That's the full wave rectification that we are talking about. All the diodes here may be considered to be ideal. We, again, we have four diodes. And we are told that the variation with time t of the alternating voltage applied to the circuit is shown in these two figures. Okay, so this graph gives me the alternating voltage, um, and, and they draw the figure twice. Obviously, they expect us to do something, some manipulation with these figures. Ah, here we go. The question says, on the axes of 7.2, specifically means go back to this figure, draw a graph to show the variation with a time t of the potential difference across diode A, specifically across diode A. So potential difference across diode A. Let's go back to this graph. I want the potential difference only across a single diode not the entire bridge. I know what the bridge is going to look like. This is what the bridge is going to look like, full wave rectification. But across diode A, I'm only getting current every half cycle. I'm only getting current when one of these terminals is positive. For the other half cycle, the current flows through B and the diode opposite it. And so I only get current in part of the cycle. Ah. I don't know which part of the cycle that is, but I know it's only half of this wave. It's half wave rectification. So if I were to draw a graph, and it'll be difficult because this graph is already given, I simply draw a graph along what's already there. So maybe if I just shade it in a bit more, it will be a little clearer to see actually. So I get a half cycle. In the next half cycle, 
current doesn't flow through the diode. But when the terminals flip again, current does flow through the diode. And so, and again, it doesn't matter if I'm choosing the positive half cycles or the negative half cycles, provided I'm only choosing one. If I don't know which, is, which direction is positive and which is negative, it doesn't really matter because the direction is arbitrary in the end. Ah, so that's what my graph looks like. Voltage reverse time is half wave rectified because I'm only considering one diode. The next question says, on the axes of 7.3, the next graph, draw a graph to show the variation with time t of the potential difference across R ah, diode B. So I still want to draw a graph of potential difference versus time, but now across the second diode. There's nothing unique about this diode. It's the same as diode A, it's just placed in a different spot. On the other half cycle, when the current's moving in the opposite direction, only then will diode B be activated. That means whatever I drew on figure 7.2, I must draw the opposite half wave rectification in figure 7.3. So if I use the positive half cycles on the top, I must use the negative half cycles here and vice versa. If I use negative on top, I should be drawing positive here. It's very important because that will determine whether you score the marks for this problem or not. They have to be phase shifted by 180 degrees. And so it turns out the graph that I'm shading now is indeed a phase shift by 180 degrees. And so yes, again, a lot of talking, but the understanding is more important than what we see here. The one mark will come eventually, but that comes with time, with understanding. Next part of the question is C, and this part says, on figure 7.1, going all the way back to 7.1, draw the symbol for a capacitor, connect it into the circuit so as to provide smoothing. I've moved away from the rectification now. We need to talk about smoothing. So I need to know what the symbol of a capacitor is. I need to know that a capacitor is simply two parallel plates, and so the electric symbol is also, the circuit symbol is simply two parallel lines, okay, and they're both equal in length. Where can I co connect a capacitor in the circuit so as to get smoothing? My load, initially, is this resistor. What I do is connect a capacitor across this resistor. And so my capacitor must be in parallel with the resistor and across its ends. And so what I essentially then create here, I label this capacitor C, is my DC output, which has been rectified, but has also been smoothed. So for smoothing, you always connect your capacitor. It's going to enable the smoothing across the terminals of the resistor. And that becomes your new DC output. Okay, so that was another mark. Three marks, but still a lot of concepts behind those three marks. We're not quite done. We're not done with this question just quite yet. Another figure, believe it or not, 7.4 shows the variation with time of the smoothed potential difference across the resistor. Ah, I add my capacitor to the circuit and I go from this, this full wave rectification, to something a little neater, something like this. Aha. Uh -huh. First things first, they ask us to state how much, or state how the amount of smoothing may be increased. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, if I want to increase the smoothing, I need to increase the time constant of the circuit. Time constant, we'll give it the Greek letter tor, is R times C. Now, I'm not going to change the output. I'm not going to change the load in the circuit. So what I need to change is the capacitance. So what am I going to do? I'm going to use a capacitor with a greater capacitance. Remember, higher time constant means less of a ripple. 
And so what I want to increase the smoothing is a capacitor with a higher capacitance. Higher capacitance, higher time constant, lower ripple. And so simply need a stronger or a better capacitor for the higher capacitance rating, higher value in farads. So the next part of the question says, on figure 7.4, So draw the variation with time of the potential difference across the resistor R for increased smoothing. Okay, so I basically need to draw I need to draw the effect of the smoothing, the effect of the capacitor on the on this graph as the smoothing occurs. Now I know that the shape is going to be the same, but I know that increased smoothing means I have less of a ripple. Now what is a ripple? The ripple is simply the distance between the peak value and the lowest value of the of the voltage. Okay, this is called the ripple. Increased smoothing means less ripple. So I need to draw basically a graph in which, as I'm showing here, has the same peak value, because the peak is not changing, but less of a ripple. So notice how the shape is roughly the same, but the drop is much less than it was before. All this means is I'm using a better capacitor. The capacitor can supply current. Remember, the capacitor charges on the way up the hill and discharges on the way down the hill. If the downhill is a lot less steep, then the capacitor is supplying more current, and hence there's a greater voltage for a longer time which means I can supply a more smooth current. So instead of getting these hills, which wouldn't be a steady, smooth DC current, I can increase the capacitance and hence get a slightly smoother, more constant flow of current with less of a flutter in it. Okay, and so that was the last part of this question. And the marks here would be Allocated as follows. Let's go back to the initial part of the, the question. One mark for any of these options here. So any one of these options for the advantage of full wave rectification as compared to half wave rectification scores you a mark. Next, we looked at the graph or rather the, the figure of the, of the circuit. And we went on to the graphs, and we were told that the variation with time uh, applied was given in the two figures, and we were asked to draw the variation of the potential difference across diode A and then across diode B. So what's important is to make sure I only shaded a half cycle, a half wave rectification. And what is even more important is that the opposite half-wave cycle is in the opposite side of the time axis. So it needs to be flipped by 180 degrees for you to score both marks. So whatever you did for one, you couldn't repeat for the second one. You wouldn't score the second mark. And so one mark each. And lastly, also for one mark, the symbol of the capacitor on our circuit has to be across the resistor has to be the last thing that you draw on the circuit, has to be there. Correct symbol, correct placement. I just added the word DC output, which wasn't asked of us. But the correct symbol and the correct placement will score you the one mark. Um, the next part of the question says, state how the amount of smoothing can be increased. Well, you can only increase it by using a higher capacitance. So you can say, by using a higher capacitance or a capacitor with a higher capacitance will increase the time constant and lower the ripple. And lastly, we are told to draw the variation with time t of the potential difference across the resistor when the smoothing is increased. Smoothing and incre increasing means ripple decreasing. And so as long as you have the same peak value 
but a lower ripple, you'll score two marks. And the shape has to be something like this. It can't be something completely out of the ordinary. So the same peak, but a smaller ripple scores you the two marks in that question. So hope that makes sense. There's a lot more drawing that's involved here. So understanding is important. You can only draw if you understand. Right? So understanding the concepts are important if you need to complete a diagram or complete a graph or something in that, in that order. Now, the last question, the final question that I want to do is from October, November 2010. Again, we've gone quite far back. This is from paper 4.3, and it's question number 6. We are told that the variation with time of the current I in a resistor is shown in this figure. It's sinusoidal. Well, you can sort of tell by looking at the shape. Here's an explain question, one that you probably won't like. Explain why, although the current is not in one direction only, power is still converted in the resistor. Hmm, okay. So current is in one direction, is not in one direction, it's alternating. It's moving one direction, then flipping and moving in the opposite, and then continuing the cycle. But power is converted in the resistor. Okay. What do we do now? I'm going to write an equation, even though we don't need to do this, to make the explanation slightly easier. Power is I squared times R. It's the, the current, the square of the current times the resistor. What does this mean? Well, what do I actually need to, to say here? Now, I can see that the power does not depend on the current on its own, but the power does depend on the square of the current. Aha! If it's dependent on the square of the current, the square of the current is always going to be positive. So what this means, it is independent of the direction. So it is independent of the direction of the current. So I wrote this little equation which wasn't necessary, but I can see that the power depends on I squared. I squared means this entire graph is shifted above the time axis. So the direction is not important. And so power is independent on the direction of the current. It's simply dependent on the magnitude of the current squared. The resistance is always positive anyway. So power is always going to be converted through a resistor, irrespective of the direction in which the current is traveling. If it's moving forward, energy goes to the resistor. If it's moving backward, energy goes to the resistor. Intuitively, if you think of it that way, it makes sense doesn't matter which way the resistor, the current is flowing, it's still carrying energy through that resistor. And the next question, the final question, says using the relation between the root mean square current and the peak current, deduce the value of the ratio of the average power converted in the resistor divided by the maximum power converted in the resistor. Okay, great. But they tell us to specifically use the relationship between RMS current and peak current. So we can't just do this any way. We can't simply write down our value even if we know what the value is. So the first thing to do would be to write down the average power. The average power, as we said before, is the RMS power. It's the RMS current squared, IRMS squared, times the resistance R, and I'm going to write down the peak power as well. Peak power is I naught squared peak current times R. I'm going to write the peak current in terms of the RMS current. Peak is root 2 times RMS. Root 2 squared is simply 2. That's 2 times I RMS squared multiplied by R. Ah, now I did this so I can actually find this ratio. I want this ratio, P average, divided by P naught, which is peak power. This is why I wrote P naught in terms of IRMS. Aha, so I get IRMS squared 
times r divided by 2 i rms squared times r. Guess what? The currents and the resistances cancel. I get a ratio that's a half. Remember, in physics we always write ratios as decimals and not as common fractions, and so this ratio is 0 0.5. Obviously the units cancel out is what you would expect from a ratio, and so this would be dimensionless. And the ratio is simply 0 0.5. So that brings us to the end of this paper. We'll quickly do a run-through of where the marks would be scored here. Now this first question about explaining why the power is still converted even though the current is not in one direction is two marks. And so if I explain that the dependence is on I squared, I get my first mark, and then conclude that it's independent on the direction of the current, I score my second mark. So this explanation needs to be thorough and needs to include these two points. Again, I didn't need all three lines, nor did I need more than three lines. So make sure your answers are concise enough that they could possibly fit in the number of lines given, if not just a little more. Okay, and the next question was to find the ratio of the average power compared to the maximum power. Well, I needed to use the relation that was given. So we're writing an equation for the average power and writing an equation for the peak power in terms of the average current or the RMS current, I've already scored two marks. The rest of it was just simple mathematics. And so ending at an accurate final ratio is what scored me the third and final mark. So you can see we covered quite a bit of we covered quite a bit of theory and we kind of covered quite a bit of concepts, but in a varied array of questions. So the questions varied quite significantly. We drew graphs, we did calculations. There were many things that we had to consider when we answered these questions. But now this gives us a better feel for the concepts. And so we will create more videos like this on the different topics, but I hope this video helped and I hope it helps you study not only because it helps you prepare for tests, etc., but also because it helps you understand the concepts that might have been difficult to understand when you simply read a textbook but now bringing those concepts out and showing how they can be applied. So that's me, Mr. K. Until next time, this is Everything is Relative. See you around.